Hello, and welcome to the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more, building up our logical base, understanding human behavior, all the things. Support, if you can, YouTube, all the channels, Spotify, wherever it may be, leave a review. My guest today, the author of this wonderful looking book that is out very shortly, it is called The Problem of 12. When a few financial institutions control everything, my guest today is Professor John Coates. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. I'm glad to have you on here. You are a professor of law and economics at Harvard, have done quite a bit, have also connected with Department of Treasury, New York Stock Exchange, served as a chair of the Investor as Owner Subcommittee of the Investor Advisory Committee of the SEC. When I was reading that, that was very extended. It's a long title. Said, yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful. And also, before Harvard, was a partner at Wachtel, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, specializing in financial institutions and mergers and acquisitions. That is quite cool. Full path of description. How do you describe how you ended up where you are currently? What are some of the major steps along the way that got you to where you are right now? Well, um, I went straight into doing Wall Street law at a law school, M&A. Did that for what seemed like several hundred years, but I think was technically only eight or nine. And then uh, left to go teach. Um, I fell in love with teaching part time while I was a, a lawyer and Harvard uh, gave me an offer. So I moved here and I've basically been here since I did do a stint uh, as general counsel uh, and uh, acting director of the Division of Corporate Finance at the Securities and Exchange Commission um, a couple years ago. So that was a, a little detour, but I'm, I'm back here at Harvard. At Harvard, I teach what I used to practice. I teach corporate governance. Uh, I teach finance, um, both in the business school and in the law school. This is great. Did you notice a difference between you and other attorneys that would make you want to teach and maybe they would not? Was there any big differentiating point on that? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I think more than a, a, I, I enjoy trying to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, not all lawyers seem to have a taste for that. They like just to do it. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of lends itself to a teaching perspective. Um, I also, I really enjoyed, I mean, I must say I got into teaching purely as an accident. I had a, a professor who, who needed help um, for personal reasons. And so I helped her teach a class while I was a lawyer. And I did that just because she asked. Uh, and then I fell in love with the moment of seeing the students' faces, you know, showing understanding, like just seeing that little flash was something. I'm not sure how many lawyers um, know about that, right? They, maybe they would like it if they did it, but uh, but uh, that was that was really the pull for me in the end. We have certain things that pull us in life and then that directs what we do and the other person didn't see that thing or feel that thing. So yeah. they never had that direction. I've always had the theme that if you have any sort of pull or thought in your mind, it's saying something. There must be something there because not everybody has that same, oh, I'd like to do that. Or some people that would think real estate, they'd see a property or some people, artists, they would see artwork. Whatever you see says something about you. Yeah, That's cool. Now, long live the legal field as well. Now, so, your material is about a few financial institutions controlling everything. The first thing that came to my mind while I was reading, and you did inform about this in the book, but how would you describe how much of where we are now has been set in stone over time? How early were the important steps that got us to where we are today? So the book is principally focused on two types of asset management companies, um, companies that manage money for other people. One type is the index fund, 
and another type is the private equity fund. Um, the foundations for their rise, um, some of them are really old in the sense that there are laws that have been in place for hundreds of years that keep banks from taking over everything. So banks used to be the financial institution that was a threat to the overall economy. Sometimes they still do cause problems, see 2008, but they've been legally blocked from buying other companies for basically as long as we've had a democracy in the US. Um, and because they couldn't do what I'm about to describe, that left a space for other kinds of institutions to, to step in and, and play that role. So that's one background. A second background would be in the 60s, um, some financial economists started getting much more interestingly creative uh, in theorizing than, than in prior periods. And they came up with um, an idea that underlies index funds, which is that it's really hard to beat the stock market. <laughs> That's the basic idea. It sounds simple, but it actually took a lot of math to kind of prove that um, first, the stock market tends to move in kind of random ways on a day-to-day -day basis. And that then means that people trying to pick and choose which stocks are going to do well tend not to do any better than average over at least short-term periods of time. And even those people who are brilliant at it and who can manage to beat the market over a year or two or three or five, um, it's hard to know who they are because there's so much randomness in the stock markets that what looks like success might turn out just to be luck. Um, and then that luck may run out. So that kind of theorizing with a lot of elaborate mathematical models um, led to the idea that don't look for a needle in a haystack, just buy the whole haystack. And that's basically what index funds do. So to, to recap, we got to keep banks out by law. And then there's a new theory that says the best way to invest is just by buying the entire index. And those are the two, I think, important um, long background factors that got us to where we are today. It still took many, many years for that idea to, to spread. And it's really only been since the year 2000 that index funds have really taken off. Um, and but, but they've been kind of going straight up since then. And they now have, you know, 25%, the, the top four have 25% of all of the stock of every company on the stock exchange, which is kind of amazing, right? Just four firms controlling 25% of every company. Right. It's a very substantial packing of the, let's say, potency or power there, which I see happening in many different categories. And when it happens, it's such a limiter. I don't think it can last for so long because once things get so concentrated, now a lot are left out of any having any opportunity. A small group has outsized ability and then there's no way that the collective can all be doing well for too long, I've noticed. It makes it kind of temporary. So one thing that comes to mind as far as the index funds is, was the item that was used to build them up into something large, the idea that people would want to be safe and instead of, okay, I don't want to pick these, oh, you already selected them for me. So using that bit of weakness in the investor, they said, no, we will take care of it. And then once they got a um, choice of what to put in the index fund and under their name, it started to build up power from that. Um, I think that's part of it. Another piece of it is that because the funds are not trying to pick and choose uh, companies uh, or stocks, they don't need to hire and keep on salary expensive, smart investment managers. They just they're buying a list and the list comes from somebody else. It's really easy. That part of it is easy. And so they can get away with charging very, very little to keep your money fully invested in the stock market. They charge five 
basis points, which is like half of a percentage of the total amount you've invested. And that's really small compared to if you paid a broker or a financial manager or an active fund that tries to pick and choose, they're going to charge you, you know, 10 times more, um, maybe more than that. So and, and on a on a year by year basis to be able to invest safely in a diversified way at that low of a cost, that's pretty powerful. That's a powerful um, pull for not just you know ordinary investors, which definitely benefit from index funds, but even people quite wealthy. Um, uh, Warren Buffett famously was asked by LeBron James a few years ago for investing advice. I don't know how they met, but somehow LeBron James and Warren Buffett were in the same room or talking. And uh, and Buffett, even though War- LeBron James had a lot of money, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at that point, Buffett said, you know, the best thing you can do is just buy an index fund. You don't have to worry about it. And and reportedly, James did that, and his net worth has tripled in this time since. And in the meantime, he's not had to pay expensive money managers anything because the index funds are so cheap, um, really, really cheap. And so, you know, if somebody at his end of the wealth spectrum is doing this, that's a pretty convincing case. That case has been spread throughout the investing world. Not everybody does it. A lot of people still try to guess which companies are going to do better. But again, the indexed share, the part of the the market that that that's in an index fund, or sometimes they're called exchange traded funds, the same basic product, um, has has gone from less than a percent to again, you know, twenty five percent of of the largest companies. Is it the case that those? early index funds or Vanguard that was in, I believe, 1970s when it was developed, that from the time they were, that early time would be like a battle to take over who's going to be the main index funds. And from then on, has much changed since the early setting of those in stone? Um, You know, it's funny, Vanguard really didn't face any real competition at first. Um, The other ones got into it later. Um, It took Vanguard you know, at least five to 10 years to start to convince anyone. Everybody used to laugh at them. Sure, you're just going to buy all the companies. Sure, that makes sense. Um, uh, But they just kept beating the average money manager year after year. And so finally, others started to copy them. Um, State Street, I think, came next. They invented, uh, you know, the exchange traded fund I mentioned a minute ago. And then... um, uh, some folks at, at uh, what was Barclays, but then it got sold a couple times on to, to what is now BlackRock. They got involved in the business. Uh, and then those three really took off, as I say, from about 2000 on. The fourth of the big ones, Fidelity, used to not be indexed. They used to really Again, they were one of the ones that made fun of Vanguard, and they they were kind of rivals with Vanguard for a long time, not because they were indexed, but because they were not indexed. They were like, "Don't buy an index, hire us. We'll do a better job than than just a simple index." Um, ironically, now Fidelity manages more in index funds than they do not, and so they've converted, if you will, over the years to the index way of thinking. They still have some active funds, but their biggest funds are. Our index, and so um, it, it it really has been Vanguard, and then slowly attracting additional competitors. Um, no, I don't think there's likely to be a fifth or sixth come along anytime soon because one of the features of index funds is they do better the bigger they are. The reason is that they um, they can spread the cost of the simple things they do over more investors as they get bigger. So the cost to each investor falls, just like, you know, Walmart can can deliver goods more cheaply than a mom and pop store because it buys at such a scale, it can get a good deal on everything it does. Same thing basically with index funds. And so it's, it's gonna be pretty hard, I think, for newcomers now to break into the top four, at least in a simple market-based way. Um, so 
that message about economies of scale you brought up in the book and it makes you wonder if once it goes into a certain direction like this how do you counter that direction does it require that it, it just goes towards that until one day that nation is gone and another empire starts can it ever turn around in some form so I, at least in the, the area I'm focused on, this not, may not be true in other areas, but in finance, what has happened over and over again is that economies of scale in finance lead the best performing firms, banks, insurance companies, and now asset management companies to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They attract more and more money. They oversee that money in a way that gives them power, not just market power, but like political power, like ability to use the sheer asset power that they sit on top of to influence the world in ways that then get everybody else really nervous. And then there's a political and eventually legal reaction. So banks initially started having a big effect on the whole economy until they were legally forbidden from doing anything other than banking. Insurance companies, late 19th century, started buying more and more companies of all kinds and started running more and more operations until there were a series of hearings and a big set of scandals and political pushback. And then in every state, even today, insurance companies are not allowed to buy more than a relatively small amount of stock of other kinds of companies. And I think the same thing is beginning to happen now with asset management, where the political system doesn't respond happily when financial institutions start having big political impacts. And so there's already bills pending in Congress to limit the ability of index funds uh, to use the shares they own to affect how corporations are being run. I don't think the bills pending are gonna pass, but I do think that's a first wave of this political kind of reaction that will start to limit the effects of economies of scale in this type of financial activity. So I don't think we're gonna squash them, or at least I hope not, because actually I think index funds are a good thing for most, most investors, uh, but we're gonna limit them, I think is the result. It's, we're gonna put some parameters on how they can exercise the power they have. That's really the problem in the title of the book. How do we limit the power of 12 people to have a really big outsized influence on the overall society? Well. There's a lot of ways to do it, and we're going to kick around a bunch of ideas, I think, over the next few years. Um, but to your point, I do think that's the limit. That's the thing that these economies of scale will will um, will elicit from the population. Yeah, it's quite cool. I also, going back to the book, The Problem of 12, when it's a small number, then you can just imagine, like they might be nameless, faceless figures, but just a small amount of individuals and guiding the force of uh, big waves upon the public financial institutions. And then the cycle there of expansion, which is new thing. Okay, new method, index funds. We're gonna build it, put it out there. Sometimes comes with a little bit of marketing and opportunities to take a bit for self around that time. Expansion always allows it. And then consolidation, like you're talking about here with rules and something to hold it down. It's like every time humanity expands a little bit and it expands too far and then, okay, we have to curtail that slightly. And that becomes the quality material we keep over time, kind of like that. It's a cool concept. And then how does this relate to also uh, private equity separately? Yeah, so private equity is a different animal. They're, 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 they, have, they have similar characteristics as index funds, which is why I'm talking about both of them in the book, but they, are, they also are pretty different. Um, all right, so how are they similar? Well, they're both managing other people's money. Um, they're both growing very rapidly and have been growing very rapidly for 25 years. They've been growing at like 15% a year every year. And that is a lot faster than the economy has been growing. So they've been capturing a bigger and bigger um, share of the overall um, uh, set of economic businesses out there. And, and so in that way, they're similar. And they're also similar in that the biggest ones 
are growing the fastest. So they're concentrating power and influence within a small number of people's hands. And that influence really is mattering to people in, in a practical way. So those are all the things that make them similar. Now, what's different is private equity doesn't just buy some shares of companies the way index funds do. They buy a whole company. They come along and they buy you know, 100% ownership of a furniture manufacturer or a, a trucking company, or more lately, they've gotten into nursing home chains or into pet companies, pet, pet supply stores or pet, you know, grooming companies, you name it, like anything that can kind of be owned as a business, private equity is interested in. And they buy whole companies, they borrow a whole lot of money to buy them. By borrowing the money, they run risk, which can blow up on them. And that's part of what makes them controversial. It also, though, means that because they borrowed too much money, they have to pay it back. Otherwise, they go bankrupt. So they work really hard to improve the business, to get more money out of it, to pay the debt down. So they're kind of known for being pretty ruthless at cutting costs, at looking for ways to get more revenue. They're sort of like super capitalists. They're like, take take any business and like, you know, they're like the extreme version of it. Um, so that's what private equity does. Um, the thing that is troubling about them, other than the fact that they're growing so fast and getting really concentrated, is that they are by design, they, they, they've, they've been structured so that they don't have to disclose anything under our securities laws to the public about what they're doing. So they're controlling now 15 to 20 percent of every business in America. They, you know, one in seven or eight workers works for a private equity company, whether they know it or not. But they don't file anything with the SEC. You can't go look up what their businesses or how they're doing, whether they're running risks, whether they're causing harms, whether they're doing good things. It's all kind of in a dark black box. And that's that's the extra layer of, of sort of worry about private equity. You don't have that with index funds. Index funds, you know what they're buying all the time. They're buying the index and you can kind of go look that up. But for private equity, you don't really know what they own fully. You don't know what they're doing with it. You don't even know who they're raising money from. They mostly raise money from pension funds and endowments and sovereign wealth funds, other big institutions. But we don't really know on a on a fund by fund basis exactly who the investors are. They keep all that quite secret. So that's the private equity world. And um, uh, and again, it's I, I think it's a growing problem. Uh, and it's politically, again, generating some some responses. There are bills pending to do all kinds of things to change the way they're regulated. Um, and I think the pressure for the, some type of regulatory change is going to continue to grow as they grow. I think about it in the same as various other categories that I look at that look helpful or interesting at first based on how they're presented. And then after the fact, you realize, wait a minute, some ability has been taken. So I use an example like say social media at first is interesting and wow, this is a nice opportunity. And then years later, you realize, wait a minute, our attention is being usurped and uh, we're being algorithmed into a certain direction. So same thing with private equity this way at first, it sounds like, oh, we'll come in and help you out and make your business smoother. And we also help uh, stabilize for the whole nation. At first, it sounds like a great thing, but after a while, it's like a figures behind in a dark space that have some control and ability, and then it starts to pull at you. And like you said, one out of, let's say, seven workers working for somebody they might, may not even know who they are. So then the, the connection that you feel to what you're doing, it starts to get pulled away. And that starts to take away from like your discipline, your pride, those kinds of things, because now it's like, am I working for some far off figure? Is it a destabilizing force, would you say? I, I, I think you've captured a couple of things that are true about private equity. I think um, when they were started back in the 70s and 80s, the kinds of companies they took over really were, frankly, often badly run. And they really benefited from the change of ownership and the, and the, and the powerful incentives that all that debt 
created to do a better job. So at the beginning, I think for the most part, they were a, a useful force in helping the U.S. economy kind of get back on track after a, a bad period um, in the 70s. I think as they've grown over time, they've um, they, they've kind of lost the role they initially played because public companies now are already pretty tightly run. I mean, they have other pressures on them. Hedge funds, for example, other kinds of institutions put a lot, index funds, put pressure on public companies to kind of not be as slack as they, they maybe once would have been. So that removes something PE can do well, private equity can do well. And instead, they've been pushing into other kinds of industries where ownership has not ever been um, really private in that sense at all. So again, I mentioned nursing homes and healthcare generally is an area where um, traditionally a lot of the ownership was with the professionals, that the, the doctors own their own practices and, 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 and sometimes nurses would participate or they would be a collection of professionals who were largely self-employed. A lot of that by moving into private equity has changed the nature of what private equity does. And I worry in those kinds of industries that um, private equity's incentives are, are not well aligned. They're, they're, they're going to take money out, but maybe at the expense of patients and customers and in ways that aren't really going to be obvious for a while, and they don't make disclosures, so it takes even longer to figure out what's happening. Uh, there are fewer journalists who write about it because they're not making disclosure. There's less awareness generally of what they're doing. And so I think as they've spread into different sectors and in different industries, um, the model they have um, starts to take on roles that are at least debatable and, and maybe even bad uh, for society. One simple way I have of thinking about this is if you think that law and, and regulation are good and well enforced in a given area, then PE private equity is probably fine. They go in and they'll, sub, they'll be controlled by the existing legal um, regime. But in a lot of areas, we don't know how to regulate well. Um, healthcare, constantly the professionals involved have to make judgments about trading off cost and benefit for a given treatment or different kinds of treatment. And we don't have rules about that. We trust the doctors, more or less, uh, or the nurses uh, or other healthcare professionals to use their professional self-respect to do the right thing, as well as to make some money. I mean, it's not like doctors don't make money, but, but they, don't, they don't push the envelope of what they're trying to do. And the law just can't control them very well. Why? Because their professional judgment is just too complicated. You can't write that down in a set of rules and then have it be enforced. So anywhere that's like that, and I'll, I'll mention one other that I'm very aware of since I teach, is education. Uh, I don't think you can easily write down rules for what makes a good educator a good educator. Um, the best universities have never been for profit. And yet, and, and so when private equity has gone into education, which it's done a couple of times, it's not done well. It's created a lot of bad outcomes, sometimes going bankrupt, sometimes they sell. And it's just another example of places where I think private equity is not a good fit. Uh, and yet it's growing so fast that it's trying to get into all these other areas um, that I don't think it's very good for. Is there something to the idea that wherever there is nuance and potential for good things in that nuance, there's also room for individuals to say, okay, there's some ambiguity there. We will reach into the part of that we can grab from because there's a little bit of open space for what people allow. Or we can't fully examine it. Do we fully understand it? Are there full rules? But then the areas of life where there is no nuance, then there's no room for uh, grabbing a percentage. It's this lemon is 50 cents and this like, five cents goes here and that's it. And so there's no room. So they leave that alone. But where there's some sort of nuance is the opportunity in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think the, the need for judgment for, as you say, nuance, looking for um, 
feeling your way forward through a forest as opposed to marching down a, a clear line in, a, in an open field, the forested areas are the ones that um, that are they, they tend to be ones where norms, social norms and professional judgment is most important. Another example is publishing, where traditionally there's always been a separation between the business side and the editorial side. And in those instances where the business people are too directly telling the editors what to publish and not publish, it tends to undermine the value of that kind of publication over time, it tends to get worse. Um, and they may actually, you know, long run, they, they fail. Um, in the short run, they may sell a bunch of particular things, but they lose the ability to use uh, that judgment to look for the nuance and like what's really interesting and not interesting. Um, I think it's one of the challenges right now for newspapers, for example, is that the business pressures are such that it's often hard for them to keep functioning as, as newspapers. So that's another area where and I think in all of those areas, private equity is a model that is a business form that's so focused on quick, clear um, cash flow, get the cash out, get cash flow up. Um, we're not interested in the nuance, <laughs> like we, you know, um, nuances for other people. We need to like meet our debt obligations. I just I think in those places, one, they're going to tend to fail, and two, where they do succeed, they often succeed at at because they're harming others in ways that can't be easily seen until it's too late. Um, so, with uh, recent guest Rebecca Faith Lawson. We had talked about the concept of, let's say you're writing, you you wouldn't want to edit the sentence while you're writing it. You would want to write down a whole essay and then come back and edit because mixing the two is it's almost self-destructive during the part. So same thing like you described in publishing there. If they're too connected, the, like you put down a page. No, I'm editing that. Oh, okay, well, I can't build momentum or any sort of uh, focus there. The deep work that Cal Newport talks about, you don't get to that. So... It's good to have a time frame for each portion so they can sit there. What would be the time frames in the financial space? So like, I think that's, uh, a, that's a great way of thinking about corporate governance generally. There's a similar need for different rhythms of feedback, different cadences at which you check yourself on whether what you're doing is progressing or not and 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 heading towards ideally like people want to make money when you make money it's because you're getting other people to pay you more than it costs you to to help them so there's value being added so that's in general a good thing but the path to doing that in a sustainable way that will allow a business to survive not just you know for a year or two but over a multi-year period is often quite complicated and um some businesses are set up better to uh, uh, to allow for that kind of experimentation over time, um, over a longer time frame than others. Um, private equity sometimes is thought of as being more patient than the public markets because they don't report every three months whether they're earning money or not. And, you know, there's something to that, but... They do have to pay their debt, which is high, every you know month or three months too, and that often is a tougher constraint, forcing you know relatively quick decision making for a significant business. In areas where you can feel pretty confident about the consequences of certain kinds of cost cutting or, or investment, that may make sense. Uh, that's the place where private equity, I think, adds value. But where you're in a space of uncertainty and you're trying to experiment and test research and development, intensive businesses, high technology often, those tend not to do well if every month or three months you have to make a giant interest payment. That's why, by the way, venture capital is is very different really from private equity. Even though they're kind of similar in some ways, the way they're they're organized and the way they raise money, venture capital basically puts just equity in. They don't raise debt typically at all, and then they're investing over a multi-year time frame, knowing that it may take 
several years to get to the right scale before really uh, trying to cash out of their investment. Private equity, they borrow a lot to make the deal work, and then the debt has to be paid right away. And so although private equity and venture capital sometimes are thought of as together, and some of the complexes actually have both kinds of funds, um, they really work very differently on exactly the dimension you're asking about. How quickly do you have to prove to some third party, venture capital, a bank, uh, that what you're doing is really generating returns and going to keep generating returns over time? I've always thought about this concept of how much time before your material is looked at, which is why sometimes doing something with four hours of deep work is so valuable because for those four hours, there's none of that. And it can really build on itself and expand and a whole nonlinear framework of thought can go into something versus if it's always it's like a micromanagement in an office. You can only do so much and it has a negative connotation because of that. Now, when it comes to the large financial institutions, what forces can counter what is happening? Who are the players in the United States that can most help to adjust them from becoming just black boxes of money management? Well, um, I, you know, this is partly because this is what I know, but also partly because I do think it's the best first step to any kind of big governance problem is more disclosure. So I, I think um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, where I used to work, can play a role along with the state securities regulators and to some extent, the courts in corporate law area push companies and funds to be more clear with their own investors about what they're doing and why and how and when. Um, so index funds, for example, um, have they've already started to do this themselves in part because they're worried about the political reaction that I'm describing in the book. They're starting to think about ways to, so for Vanguard, um, they have a fund, S&P 500 fund. They have a million investors. They vote the shares in that fund. They control Exxon, Apple shares, et cetera, and they, they make decisions about how to vote. But what they're starting to experiment with is to allow their own investors, the million people who gave Vanguard their money, to tell Vanguard what their preferences are about certain kinds of voting decisions. Not each vote, it's too complicated and there are too many, 4,000 companies, thousands and thousands of votes every year, but at least give us a policy that we can look to. And if enough of you give us a policy of various kinds, then we can use that to shape how we decide to use our power for you. And then we'll tell you what we're doing so you can see that we're not doing anything strange or unusual with our power. All right. Um, now, what do these policies look like? Um, they are all over the place so far in terms of exactly how they're written. But to give you a sense of it, um, one policy might be a sustainable, socially responsible investment policy that whenever there's a climate related issue um, pushes for more progressive openness to adapting to a, a, a carbon neutral future. Uh, and then you might have another policy that says, forget about that climate forward stuff. We just want to make money. Uh, and if that means like burning some more carbon in the near term, great. And so you've got like at a high level, these, you know, imagine on a spectrum, green to brown kinds of um, voting um, policies. Vanguard then would be told, well, 30% of our shareholders like the green one, 5% like the brown one. I'm making up these numbers to be clear. Um, and then like 60% didn't respond. We, we can't get in touch with them. They're asleep. They're not paying attention, whatever. So we're going to take into account those uh, policy choices when we decide how to vote. And it's not going to determine our vote, but at least it, we're going to shape it. We're no longer going to go all one way or the other. We're going to do a little bit. 30% uh, this way, 5% this way, 60% kind of in the middle. So they're starting to try to build a structure that will allow the whole population that invests through them to have some influence over how their money is being used. So that's um, it's partly about disclosure because they're talking about what they're doing. It's partly about consultation. 
It's not binding. It's not like they're going to literally follow the instruction of John Coates just because he's an investor in, in the fund. But he's going to list. They're going to listen to the kinds of policies I, I pick. So that's that's on the index fund side. On the private equity fund side, again, I, I think it's interesting to notice that they themselves, I think, know they have a a disclosure issue because they put out reports on their own voluntarily uh, to the public that they don't have to. And I think they do that in part because they're worried, about, again, about the political uh, reaction. Some of these reports are, again, about climate. They say things like, we're only investing in climate friendly businesses or to the extent we're buying businesses that, that use energy, we're pushing them to do more um, solar uh, or the like. So they put out these reports. The problem with that right now, the reason that's not enough, I think, is that they're not um, they're not getting any kind of audit. There's no independent check on what they're saying. So they could, frankly, just be spinning us. Um, there's no comparability between the reports. So you can't compare them to each other. Um, and there's no kind of standardized framework for the kinds of topics that they talk about. So for my preference, I would like it if uh, the SEC or other agencies began to develop some reporting that private equity firms would have to do on a variety of important effects they have on society. So in the case of healthcare, they should talk about outcomes and like what are some things that you can use to measure whether the benefits of private equity ownership are good or bad uh, for healthcare patients and the like. I, I think that kind of reporting, um, and, and it needn't to be every three months. I'd kind of like it, actually, if it were more like an annual cycle rather than a quick, you know, every three month cycle. But annually, we ought to be getting more information about what they're doing and what kind of effect they're having. I think those would be really good first steps. And then if we look at it and we would realize they're really having bad effects, all right, then we can do something more than that. But um, I think more information would be good before we did. Is there a counterforce to that from the institutions where they have lobbying or they are not interested in taking part or they obfuscate their information so as to not participate? Yes. I mean, I, I think they will fight predictably tooth and nail to prevent anything from being required of them. They're happy to do volunteer reports. They get to choose what's in them and, and how reliable they are how expensive they are. But um, they will, yeah, absolutely will fight. They're fighting right now. I mean, the SEC has a very, mod to me, seems like a very modest proposal about disclosures relating to conflicts of interest, for example. And they're fighting even that. Um, and so I think it'll be a political struggle even to get what I think of as like the cautionary first step disclosure uh, to a better place. Um, it'll it'll take it'll take some real effort. Um, you know, at the end of the day, private equity raises money from institutions, pension funds, for example, who are in theory representing millions of Americans. And another channel to change private equity is through those institutions. So, uh, you know, the, the California Public Employee Retirement System, CalPERS, is a major investor, and they have, from in some years, put money into private equity. As a private equity investor, you could put pressure on CalPERS in California to then put pressure on private equity to disclose more. There has already been some of that that's happened uh, in California in particular, in Illinois. Um, I think if more public awareness of the way in which this money was being raised and managed um, spread, I think the political pressure for more disclosure could be uh, developed that way. Um, and I think both are both things are likely, federal um, Washington kind of pressure and, and state level pressure as well. Hmm. One thing that came to mind is for the average person in the United States who is not connected with large financial institutions directly, what might they notice in the next 10 years? Would anything change? over time, how does the average person notice these things or does it not hit their radar? Well, um, uh, you know, somewhere in their late 20s, early 30s, most people begin to save some money for retirement. All right. And these days, if you're asking just neutrally some financial advisor what to do with it, they typically say an index fund. As I said, Warren Buffett said to LeBron. When you pick an index fund, you should think, all right, I'm not really picking them for investment 
um, brilliance because they're just going to buy an index. I'm buying them because they're cheap first to make sure the fees are low. But then second, like what do they stand for? How are they using the power that they have because I and others are giving them our money to use to invest for us? And I think increasingly you're going to be able to ask for and get, well, this index fund really is quite progressive on issues of diversity or take your pick. And this index fund is much less so. That should matter to people uh, when they're making their choice. One other thing, when people make these choices, they tend not to make them again. They like put the money in and they like the whole point of this is to then forget about it. So it's important to pick them right to begin with. Get as informed as you can at the moment you're picking the fund. Don't just pick it based purely on what you've heard of before, because then that's just brand, you know, rewarding brand investment. Instead, like, look, are they like making reasonable, responsible uh, voting choices for me? And and so that's on the index fund side. On the the private equity side, there it's really more if you're an employee or a citizen or or both, uh, where there's a pension fund or some other fund that you are supposed to be getting a share of, there should be some vehicle for you to learn about it. You should get information about it and like what's in it and how, how do you know what it's going to be worth when you retire. Um, and some ability to influence its governance. And again, I would, you know, so if you're a member of a teacher's union and CalSTRS is your pension plan, um, your, uh, your, your union representatives who help bargain for the, the, the pension benefits, they're a channel for influence over how this money is being used. It's, it's huge amounts of money that's being invested in theory for you that then having effects on the economy that often is more important than the financial returns you're getting. So seeing the big picture, seeing the way in which your money is ultimately being used in ways that matter to you is, is another piece of this. This is a key one there, discernment. Uh, you'll get more information maybe coming and also using more discernment with that information so that you are supporting something that you'll be glad about down the line because it is a longer term type of thing. Yep. What would be, if you had a takeaway from your book, a message you would want people to come away with after having read it about the few financial institutions that control everything? Well, uh, you know, the main thing is just hopefully new vocabulary, new awareness. These are not the big bank banks that caused the 2008 crisis. These are not... Um, you know, other kinds. These are new kinds of financial institutions that kind of are to some extent under the radar of the awareness of most people realize they are the big gorillas now. Like they're more important to your future than, you know, pick a lot of other boogeymen from the past. Um, um, Exxon's board got changed because of index funds not the other way around, right? So Exxon is changing because the index funds push them to change. And if you care about the future of the climate or energy policy or the like, that should matter, right? So that's the first big takeaway. These guys are really important to the future. Second big takeaway is um, index funds, I think, are like, you, you just can't argue with they do a good job for most people. So let's not kill them. Let's not overreact. Let's make sure that whatever our reaction politically, socially and talking about them is sort of moderated. We want to keep them doing what they're doing. We just want to make sure they're doing it in a way that's responsible. But private equity, the challenge would be show us if you think you're adding value, if you really think you're good for America, prove it to us. One thing I haven't mentioned that I mentioned in the book a little bit is private equity also gets tax subsidies. They have better taxation than the rest of us do. And in theory, they should be able to defend that in a way that's not just behind the scenes. They should be able to openly and, and, and straightforwardly say, here's why we need these tax benefits in order to keep raising money and investing the way we do. Um, I really would be skeptical of that, and I would listen carefully to my elected officials, many of whom take money from the private equity industry. And so look for that force of 
you know, potential corruption out there in your political life. That would be another uh, big takeaway. It's a great message there. It's like the link between at some point there's, let's say, a weakness or somebody needs help in something. Somebody shows up and says, I will help you, but I will also take some for me. And then the third step is the people on this side asking all the steps you're doing. Why this? Why this? Why this? Because maybe they added in a few that had nothing to do with the helpfulness in mind. Interesting one. Professor John Coates, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode, a discussion about the problem of 12 when a few financial institutions control everything and our talk should be going up when this comes out on August 15th. Glad to have you on here. I came very nice to be with you, Armin. Take it. I, take, I, 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 I uh, enjoyed the discussion. I very much enjoyed it as well, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And we are out.